Since 1886, Johnson & Johnson's name has been on everything. Baby oil, shampoo and conditioner, moisturizer, Dwayne, The Rock Johnson. But one of their most iconic products is talcum baby powder. And while it might have kept our downstairs dry, it also may have caused some very harmful side effects. Johnson & Johnson is facing thousands of lawsuits over allegations that some of its talc powder was contaminated with asbestos. It's been a product mainstay for Johnson & Johnson for decades. Now, talcum baby powder is at the center of multiple investigations. At issue, has the company hidden evidence that its baby powder is linked to asbestos and ovarian cancer in women who use it around their genitals? J&J &J has long since denied the claim, but now documents reveal the company knew about the presence of small amounts of asbestos in its products as far back as 1957, but did not disclose that to the public. Thousands of people have sued J&J, &J, some winning tens of millions of dollars in judgments. Johnson & Johnson ordered to pay $55 million to a South Dakota woman who blamed her ovarian cancer on the company's talcum powder. A St. Louis jury awarded 62-year-old Lois Slemp more than $110 million. A jury awarding a California woman $417 million. One single verdict for 20 women exceeded $2 billion. Whoo wee That's a lot of lawsuits. I mean, you know you f***ed up when your company is giving away more money than Powerball. And I get why it's happening. Because, guys, you cannot be selling baby powder with asbestos in it. People are rubbing this stuff all over their bodies. Not to mention the cocaine dealers who mix it in with their product. Now you've got innocent cokeheads snorting asbestos. It's unacceptable. Now, the experts over at Johnson & Johnson, they, they, they have found a cure. But unfortunately, it's not a cure for the cancer. It's for the company's legal problems. Johnson & Johnson is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in hopes of what the company says of disposing of 40,000 lawsuits. In order to limit their liability, as well as to shield their corporate assets, Johnson & Johnson pulled something that's actually known as the Texas Legal Loophole, also known as the Texas to Step Defense. J&J &J is this super rich health products company headquartered in New Jersey. So J&J &J went to Texas and using a quirk of that state's laws, they created a completely new company called LTL. Then Johnson & Johnson dumped all the liability for these baby powder asbestos lawsuits, you know, tens of billions of dollars of legal risk into this new firm. Then the new company, LTL, quickly filed for bankruptcy. Critics say the company is abusing the legal system and have called the bankruptcy filing a gimmick. Yeehaw! The Texas two-step. I'll spin that jury round and round, change your name and flee the town. Do I get a record deal? This is insane, people. Johnson & Johnson is pretty much trying to do the first thing everyone thinks of when they get caught. Blame it on their evil identical twin. I mean, we've all tried it. The only difference is it somehow actually works if you're a powerful corporation. Honestly, I'm, I'm almost impressed. I just wish they put as much effort into COVID immunity as they did into their legal immunity. But look, as, as crazy as this is, J&J &J is hardly a trailblazer when it comes to abusing bankruptcy laws to get out of trouble. Purdue Pharma has filed for bankruptcy as the maker of OxyContin tries to protect itself from mounting lawsuits. Purdue Pharma made billions off the painkiller OxyContin. The bankruptcy filing is seen as a way to protect Purdue Pharma from nearly 3,000 lawsuits. The Boy Scouts of America has filed for bankruptcy protection after an onslaught of lawsuits alleging rampant sexual abuse of children for decades. They may claim that they don't have the ability to play these, pay these claims, but the real reality is that they use the bankruptcy to really continue to hide and shield themselves from real liability and forced disclosure. The Roman Catholic Church is one of the world's wealthiest institutions. Across the United States, priest abuse victims, now adults, are lining up to sue their diocese for damages. But the church is going to extraordinary lengths to protect its assets, and that strategy is bankruptcy. Chapter 11 was not designed to protect organizations who've engaged in criminal conduct or basically protecting criminal conduct. It was designed to give companies who made bad business decisions a new start. Yeah, I'm sorry, people. Purdue Pharma is not bankrupt. 
and the Catholic Church is definitely not bankrupt. Ain't no bishops rolling into pawn shops asking how much they can get for that Michelangelo ceiling. Now, the Boy Scouts are the ones where I'm like, yeah, you, you might actually be broke. I mean, these guys are rubbing sticks together to start a fire, my man. A 12 pack of Bic lighters is like three bucks, get your life together. But for real, we know it's all bullshit, right? And shielding super rich institutions from punishment isn't what bankruptcy protections are supposed to be about. And fortunately, there's a movement in Congress to end some of these abuses of bankruptcy laws. And here to talk about it is California Congresswoman Katie Porter. Representative Porter, welcome to The Daily Show. Thank you so much. Let's jump straight into the issue at hand. I, I didn't know this before I was reading up on this issue, but you taught bankruptcy law for years before joining Congress. And now, once again, bankruptcy is in the conversation with Johnson & Johnson, them wanting to split off their baby powder company as a separate entity so that Johnson & Johnson as a whole can't be held liable for what happened to so many people out there. From a bankruptcy expert's point of view, as somebody who studied it and taught it, what do you think we're missing in these conversations when we allow companies to declare bankruptcy to avoid some sort of, I guess, accountability? Well, I think this is fundamentally a problem about preventing corporate abuse. And bankruptcy is really the tool that these corporations are using to avoid liability for the damage and harms that they caused. In this case, many, many, many women getting devastating and deadly cancers from using baby powder laced with asbestos. Um, but fundamentally, this isn't really a bankruptcy problem. It's a larger problem about how do we make sure that companies that make money are also on the hook for paying for the harm that they cause along the way. And that's a problem we see in environmental issues with offshore drilling, for example, and oil leaks. It's a problem that we see with product liability. Um, and so this is one more example of it, but the bankruptcy issue here does, I think, tend to be a place where corporations have been very successful at getting off the hook. Yeah, why does it seem that individuals are held to a different standard to corporations and that if I do something to you, I would be forced to pay for that or I would be forced to make amends for what I'd done. But if I, as a corporation, did something to you, I can somehow get off the hook. We saw that with the Sackler family with the opioid crisis. You know, millions of Americans are either dead or, you know, addicted to drugs because of this opioid crisis. And I think the key thing that is similar to the Johnson & Johnson is that they knew. We find out time and time again that the companies knew what they were doing was harming people. It wasn't a mistake. And then not only did they not say anything, but oftentimes they pushed their products even more. Like, is there any shift amongst yourself and your colleagues in holding these companies accountable? Absolutely. So we're working on legislation that would limit companies' abilities to do this. So it's important to remember the entire idea of a corporation is to, in fact, protect the owners from being fully liable mm -hmm. for things that go wrong. And the idea is if we were all on the hook for everything we did wrong, we would not take risks. We would not invent new products. We would not develop new things. So that principle is good, but it has to have bounds and limits. And what we're seeing with the Sacklers, what we're seeing with Johnson & Johnson is companies use very, it basically exploit a combination of state and federal law to get off the hook. The whole point of bankruptcy is to help companies or people who cannot pay. Johnson & Johnson can pay. If this is a company with $440 billion, it is perfectly capable of paying for the harms it caused. One of the, 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 the more disturbing um, facts from the story is the fact that Johnson & Johnson specifically targeted black women to use the products even though they knew that they were harmful and they knew that I think 60% of, the, of their customer base of that talc powder was specifically black women. It, 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 I think it definitely would erode the trust that people have in these, in these companies. It erodes their trust in whether or not they can be held accountable. And there's, there's no denying, I mean, even now with vaccines, a lot of people in the black community are saying, we don't trust any of these pharmaceutical companies. We don't trust America's medicine and its history with us as black people. And now there was, there's gonna be some people who say, well, then why should I get a Johnson & Johnson vaccine? How can I trust that? Are you, are you prepared for, you know, what this means? Have, have you thought about how the fallout of Johnson & Johnson could affect, I think, a larger health messaging? I think that's a really interesting point. I do want to observe one really important difference about vaccines. Exactly because we have in our country led bad actors who have put products into the into the product stream that have hurt people mm -hmm. get off the hook, 
we've taken a different approach for vaccines. So anyone who believes that they were harmed by a vaccine doesn't have to look to the manufacturer. You can go directly to a vaccine fund that already exists because we're not going to make people. We want people to take vaccines and we want to reassure them that there will be damages, there'll be help. If, they're, if they think they're harmed, there's a place to report that and to get the help that they deserve and the justice that they may need. And so we've actually, I think, on vaccines, corrected this injustice. The problem is we haven't done it for all these other products, mm. including, as you mentioned, opioids, including Johnson & Johnson and the baby powder and other kinds of dangerous products in the, in the, in the marketplace. And this is, is true, by the way, for things like safety seats, um, baby seats and car seats, another issue I've worked on, tainted baby food, baby formula. Th this is a chronic problem where Companies put things into the marketplace, they know they're dangerous, and then they use corporate law to try to deny justice to those that they hurt. Before I let you go, I would be remiss if I did not talk to you about what the whole country is waiting to see um, a move on, and that is the Build Back Better plan. Many people are frustrated, understandably, at the fact that they voted for Democrats, the Democrats are now in power, they want to see something happen. They, they want to see a change in, in their health care, you know, whether it's the dental and vision. They, they want to see a change in, in college and, and the price that people pay. They want to see changes in the things that Democrats promised them they would see changes in. And yet now it feels like not only is nothing happening, but the promise list is slowly being whittled down to a very small group of things. I mean, the last I saw it, you know, now the richest people would be getting tax cuts. What, what is your message to the American public and what is your message to your colleagues who, who may be holding up the system as you see the results, I mean, in Virginia, speaking for themselves? We are definitely as close as we have ever been to moving this bill. I just heard my colleagues, I was in a meeting, and we were all like, let's go vote on it right now. I think we are ready to do it. And I, I want to say, there are, there are times in this process where we've tried to get things done and we haven't gotten all of them. But I have to be honest, I never thought as a working mom, as a single parent in this country, that I would ever see my government understand how hard it is to afford childcare, would ever understand how important it is to give little kids, preschoolers, toddlers, that early childhood education they need. I never thought we would finally stand up to big oil companies and fossil fuel companies and protect our planet, and we are actually going to do those things in this bill. Mm. And I will tell you, everybody understands that this bill is the beginning of delivering on the president's promises. It is not the end. And so I feel very, very good that we are going to pass these programs. They are going to improve people's lives. So we have to keep on delivering for, for Americans and we appreciate their patience as we get this done. Well, Representative Porter, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, hopefully we'll see you back on the show again soon. Thanks so much.